have much of the information, I don't really know um, now. Um, perhaps we don't have another um, speaker here, so Robin has done a lot of things. We want to fill out the time. Um, so um, I have been left here alone. Um, so thank you for coming um, today. Um, to, and I'd like to share some of my thoughts um, on some animal studies and also Hong Shaxin's film on the assassin. And um, also, I'd like to thank Emily, um, who invited me here. Um, thank you very much for this very rare opportunity. So, I will begin um, my paper by tackling with um, the conference theme, so that's the theme of this conference. So which is Life at a Threshold, that is the main title, and the subtitle is Biopolitical Post-Human and Non-Human. So since no human, whatever that means, is included in the entire conference theme, or to put it another way, since human has been ontologically epistemologically, and therefore academically and uh, institutionally excluded to be taken into consideration. I was wondering what life it is at the threshold, because that is the main title, life at the threshold. So what is on the other side of the threshold? Perhaps you know, there are three possibilities biopolitical life, post-human life, and non-human life. But who gets to choose from among the three kinds of life? Of course, there are several permutations. But still, who is it that gets to choose? If there is no human at this point, and the three kinds of life are yet to be chosen, that is, not decided yet, then who or what is it? that makes the choice. Nevertheless, there is one question that we need to address ourselves in the first place before we answer that one. How to make a decision before the choosing? Um, as you know, once the decision is made, we follow the uh, standard protocol. Her standard is the demands that come afterwards. We integrate ourselves into the working of the system. We continue to make decisions small decisions. But more often than not, we are made to make decisions already made for us. That's usually the case. Therefore, my, today, uh, the topic um, of, my, of my paper today is the uh, politics of decision making. <coughs> um, the Taiwan filmmaker, Bo Xiaoxian, seem to make a decision that is the assassin uh, produced in 2015 has to be a film of its own decision that betrayed the Shah tradition while at the same time following closely um, the spirits of Russia. All the conventional and familiar Russia ingredients are scrupulously kept on them either minimized, marginalized, suppressed, or completely ignored and ostracized. We don't get to see much fighting, flying, killing, screaming, blood spluttering, severed arms and legs, crossing the air, and heads rolling on the ground in the assassin. <clears throat> um, what we do get to see is mostly sporadic storylines and confusing characters. Some tend to be identifiable, and they come and go without causing too much attention. While the others are ambiguously confusing because of some overlap, where the same actor, five design, plays more than one role without giving us clear clues or because of long takes from a distance where the phrase becomes slurred. Human interaction is keep as ritualistic and simplistic as possible. Even though the assassin presents a world of Lucia characters without obviously characteristic, um, artifacts, however, seem to animate the filmic environment. 
Throughout the film, there are only a few close-ups, all of them in animated objects, a broken mask, a mirror, a JG, pendants, together with endless corridors, household silken curtains, tree branches and twigs, and many other objects. They seem to conspire together to envelope, obfuscate, and or marginalize actors and actresses in the film. When finally we get to see characters take the central stage, oddly, they don't move much, they don't fight much, or they don't even move at all. That is the oddest part. So um, here, allow me to give you a brief introduction um, to some main characters of this film. So um, that, let me introduce you um, anti-clockwise from the uh, lower right corner, that is the heroine of this film, Ye Yin Yang. Um, she is the assassin, and she's the daughter of um, Nie Feng, that is the uh, one with the beard, the dark her. <clears throat> And right beside Yang um, is the governor, and who was her childhood play, uh, playmate, and also her cousin. And now Yang has a master who happens to be her aunt, the nun, and she trained her to be an assassin, a very, very highly skilled assassin. And now her mission, being as a mission, is to kill her cousin, her lover, a long time ago, um, the governor. So that's the entire story. <clears throat> and um, now, here is the uh, greatest part. Um, okay. So at one point, <clears throat> This is um, Nye Yang's father, and she just got information. He is now aware of the purpose of his daughter coming back is to assassinate um, the governor. And he knew it by heart that once this happened, and his life and the entire life of the family would fall down. So um, he was really quite worried. And so before this, this um, screenshot, he has been sitting there in the living room for about one minute without a bunch, something like a statue. And then um, his wife comes into the scene. And then um, he tells his wife that, do you know the purpose of our daughter coming back? That her purpose is to kill the government. And then they stand there, like two statues, staring at each other for about, um, let me see, for about 20 seconds or so. It's quite long, really quite long. I'm sorry, 30 seconds. I count, I did. <laughs> for about 30 seconds. Without a batch. They simply stare at each other. And then, um, this old butler comes into the scene and announces that the governor would like to wish to see um, the, uh, the provost, that is, um, he and his father. And he didn't make any response to that announcement. He continues to stare into his wife for another 12 seconds before he left to the butler. <clears throat> out of the scene. So all together, uh, it's about uh, 42 to 52 seconds there. So this is really a very artist part. <clears throat> and, uh, so far as I know that some of the audience, when they get to this part, they simply left the theater. They give up entirely. They simply couldn't figure out what is really doing in this film. <clears throat> um, so, so um, 
Ni Nan's father, at this point, is really a very, very peculiar character. So previously, the governor has this meeting. This is before this. With his men, and throughout the entire meeting, Ni Fong simply sit there like a statue, without even slight his touch. His facial expression remains the same all the way through. Um, let's look at this part. So, as you can see, that this is in the meeting, and up there is the governor sitting there. And um, right beside me, uh, Ni Fong, that is Ni Yuan's father. Um, is his uh, brother-in-law. And the brother-in-law says something that angers the uh, governor. Mm. So the governor is really very angry, and he throws something but not there. And then um, if we compare the entire um, shot that lasts for about um, 3 minutes and 20 seconds, he informed me and his father simply sit there. He's literally a statue. <clears throat> so, um, as a matter of fact, um, this is a simple question that I've never posed um, today to ask myself. Um, what is he really doing there without doing anything? <clears throat> but now, let's uh, simply put this aside and allow me to talk about two animals. I will get back to you um, and see. Which seem to, um, the two animals seem to belong to the same family, um, the uh, porcupine and the hedgehog. The most distinguishing feature of the porcupine is its coat of quills. An adult porcupine has about 30,000 quills that cover all of its body except its underbelly, face, and feet. When porcupines are threatened, they contract the muscles near the skin, which causes the quills to stand up and out from their bodies. When the quills are in this position, they become easier to detach from the body. Although porcupines can shoot their quills at arrows, the quills do detach easily. If a predator were to attack a porcupine, the uh, slightest touch can launch dozens of quills in the predator's body. The barbs at the tip become lodged in the flesh of an attacker and are difficult and painful to remove. <clears throat> Obviously, there is a uh, clear cut boundary that separates and protects the uh, porcupine from the uh, potential threats. And as you can see, porcupines is exactly the hero we expect to watch in this uh, tradition. So in contrast, the hedgehog also looks like a warrior with about um, 6,000 quills on its body. It's only about one-fifth um, of the quills on the uh, porcupine's body. The difference is that the quills are not barbed and they are not detachable. A defense that all species of hedgehog, hedgehogs possess is the ability to roll into a tight ball, causing all of the quills to point outwards to protect the tight head, feet, and belly. This is the hedgehog's last but most successful form of defense. So this titan ball in defense is an organism with perfect geometric symmetry, which corresponds to the romantic aesthetics of the 19th century Germany. Carl Wilhelm Friedrich Schlegel, 19th century poet and philosopher, said, a fragment, like a small work of art, has to be entirely isolated from the surrounding world and be complete in itself, like a hedgehog. Anyway. So a fragment implies a relationship between a part and a whole, and usually presupposes the being of the totality from which the fragment comes. 
If we put all the relevant fragments together as if we are piecing together all the puzzles, we expect to get the whole picture of that totality. That's the working of the Metaki. However, on the other hand, the fragment also suggests disruption, separation, and destruction. Like in France and England, there were satirical traditions of rat eaten or ruined texts, ancient structural remains, and architectural ruins. The suture and the rapture, the diametrically contradictory and mutually exclusive nature of the fragment, is the literary absolute. According to Lacoulaba and Jean-Luc Monsi in their collaboration of the same name, literary absolute. According to Lacoulaba and Monsi, Schlegel begins to think differently about the meaning of the fragment in his book, Athenian Fragments. The fragment is there not to reconstitute the wholeness of the totality, but to capture that which makes the totality possible or the epiphany of pure idea. Fragment ceases to be something left, cut, distorted from the totality, but the means to imagine the possible process that forms the totality. And according to Rudolf Gachet, the fragment no longer represents the negative side of something left and finished, but the positive mode in which the representation of the whole can occur, an index of thinking is shift to conceptualizing the very occurring or coming into the presence of the idea. As Schlegel says, many works of the ancient have become fragments. Many works of the modern are fragments at the time of their origin. Schlegel took up and renewed a tradition which was typically German and went back to Luther's translation of St. Paul on the partiality of human knowledge, because our knowledge is partial, as he says. Schlegel, of course, is familiar with the French tradition of literary forms, such as epigram, the maxim, the sentence, and um, here comes his famous metaphor, as I quote just now. An aphorism ought to be internally isolated from the surrounding world like a little work of art, and complete in itself at the page one. He seeks to establish the fragment as a literary and philosophical concept instead simply as a literary genre, or ancient sculptural or literary remains. Unlike aphorisms, which are short and complete statements, Schlegel conceives his fragment as fundamentally incomplete not by representing missing parts in a way of Latin eat or ruined pieces of the satirical tradition, but by expressing the essential incompleteness of all artistic or literary endeavor. Hoda's sculptural fragments as deliberate echoes of both ancient fragments and the unfinished works of Michelangelo embody these ideas in plastic form. If we reach Schlegel's metaphor again, without some words, an aphorism ought to be entirely isolated from the surrounding world, like a hedgehog. What needs to remind ourselves along our discussion is a simple but constantly ignored fact. A hedgehog is not an aphorism. A hedgehog is a living animal with flesh and blood, even though it is a nocturnal animal. It cannot be possibly completely isolated from the surrounding world. It sleeps mostly in the daytime and hunts for the food at night. It breathes, it eats, it walks, and sometimes it walks across the road. And that is Basically, Derrida's question, as Derrida points out. A hedgehog is not a phoenix. It is not an eagle. 
The hedgehog stays very lowly, low down, close to the earth, neither sublime nor incorporeal. It is not angelic either. <clears throat> what if a vehicle coming at its direction when it is crossing the road? So there it does says, and this is what the hedgehog does. It blinds itself, there it does says. Brought up in a ball, prickly with spines, vulnerable and dangerous, calculating and ear adapted because it makes itself into a ball. Sensing the danger on the auto route, it exposes itself to an accident, end quote. Separate itself from the rest of the universe, the hedgehog and world less suggests not passive defense or total surrender, like an ostrich burying its head in the sand. And by the way, this is wrong. The ostrich do not bury their heads into the sand, otherwise they will simply choke to death. They need to breathe, right? It's simply a metaphor, it's simply a myth. And because they have all their eggs inside the sand, so from time to time, they simply need to um, duck their, their small head into their nest in order to check whether the uh, eggs are fine or not, and then you know, to uh, move them a little bit. So it's simply a misunderstanding. <clears throat> but anyway, getting back to that metaphor. So um, a hedgehog is like an ostrich burying its head in the sand. Um, so, um, but a hedgehog acts actively, it participates into the surrounding by, by um, balling itself. As Charles Rosen says, its separation is aggressive. It projects into the universe precisely by the way it cuts itself off. It opens up by closing itself into a ball, connecting itself to the existence of what is outside itself, not by reference, but by its inability and also instability. It is the very moment for the hedgehog to make a decision. Everything happens before the instant of decision. So elsewhere, when Derrida picks up on the topic of decision once again, it's already in the later stage of his career. In the animal that I am, he refers to the act of border crossing, or in today's context, the act of threshold crossing as an apocalyptic experience initiated by the encounter with the animal, which creates the abysmal limit of the human, the e-human or the a-human, which um, means the ends of man. That is to say, the border crossing from which vantage Man dares to announce himself to himself, thereby calling himself a name that he believes he gives himself. And in these moments of nakedness, Derrida, he says that he is like a child, ready for the apocalypse. He is following the apocalypse itself. He identifies with it by running behind it, after it, after its whole zoology. When an instant of extreme passion passes, he finds peace again, and he can relax and speak of the beasts of the apocalypse, visit them in a museum, sees them in the heat. He can visit them at a zoo, read about them in the Bible, or speak about them as in the book. So the apocalyptic experience is exactly uh, from my perspective, what Ho Xiao Xi is the assassin endeavors to achieve the entire film. He chops off the storyline into fragmentary episodes and creates the seemingly double wrong here and there. They are themselves self enclosed hedgehogs with prickly spawns being outstretched 
in a hope to connect to the surrounding world. At that particular moment, they are making crucial decisions. They are simply at that particular instant of the so-called passion. So before we make up our minds to cross the threshold, how do we come to our decisions? Thank you.